Okay, class, so we're at chapter 11, so we're almost home. We've got chapter 11 and chapter 12 to complete the course. And this class goes into what are called standard costs and variances. And I've referenced this concept of variances a number of times throughout this semester. So now we're going to actually take a look and see what they're talking about. Um, we also, when we look at standard costs and variances, we're going to refer back to this idea of having a flexible budget variance. So what are standard costs? Well, standard costs are the budgets for a single unit of a product. So in other words, we have budgets for all the costs. Now we want to look at what does it cost just to make a single unit? So we want to develop a standard for each type of product, but we can also use standard cost in service companies. This will, this will be used as a benchmark. In other words, a standard cost is kind of what you're shooting for, or at least an estimation of what one unit should cost. So it's a benchmark for evaluating the actual costs. So there are different types of standard costs. There's the ideal standard cost based on the perfect or ideal conditions. There are per perfection standards that do not allow for any poor quality raw materials, waste, machine breakdown, etc. And that's, of course, what we used in our lean production systems when we were talking about all of that in a different chapter. Um, sometimes this is a cultural thing. For example, the Japanese, they would use a perfection standard, whereas in the United States, we typically will use what's called a practical standard, and that's based on the currently obtainable conditions. So in other words, we allow for normal wastes and efficiencies. And it's just, again, it's kind of a mindset, and it's also a way of setting these benchmarks. So when you compute a standard cost, it goes back to the fundamental idea that we have direct material, direct labor, manufacturing overhead, and then we'll have a standard for both the variable manufacturing overhead and the fixed manufacturing overhead. <clears throat> if you look at the standard cost card for one unit, <clears throat> and I believe this is for a case of tortilla shells, So case of tortilla shells, notice that standards will have a standard quantity and a standard price for each one of those four areas that we talked about, direct material, direct labor, variable overhead, fixed overhead. And so we're just going to take what the standard quantity is times the standard price, and it'll give us these standards. Now, we'll refer back to this information when we go in and we do the different variances. But for right now, just understand that our standard cost for one case of making uh, tortilla shells is $12. All right, now, as I mentioned, we look at this from the concept of flexible budgets. In other words, not the master budget where we plan for 29,000 cases, but for the actual number of cases of 31,000. And this is in the sense that we produced 31,000 cases. So notice the flexible budget is also based on 31,000 cases. And this is so we're comparing apples to apples. And here is the standard cost that we came up with in the previous slides. And here's the difference between the two. And remember, whenever the, um, in the case of direct materials, direct labor, manufacturing overhead, when the actual cost is less than the flexible cost, that's favored. Favorable because it costs less. Okay, so these two are unfavorable because the actual costs, if you notice, are more than the flexible budget cost. Okay, so direct material, direct labor, variable manufacturing overhead, you can take a look at 
as a per unit basis, and then you can see how much it is after you multiply times the number of cases. Now, there's a number of different variances. So for each of the production um, components, direct material, direct labor, and factory overhead, we are going to have a price variance and a quantity variance. And those two combined will show that in this case, we had $8,500 favorable for the flexible budget. Okay, so where'd that come from? Back here, remember it was $8,500 favorable for the direct materials. But now what we want to do is we want to break it up into the price variance and the quantity variance. We want to know is this favorable variance coming from the fact that we got a lower price or were we more efficient with how we used our materials? Now, here's a series of formulas that can be used to calculate these variances. And my preference is if you can use it, and in most cases at least 90%, you can use this format right here. And you can see that it breaks it up into the direct material price variance and the direct material quantity variance. Here's the formula that I like to use. You can use the other formulas, and this, when you add these two together, is the total direct material variance. Now, these are an explanation of some of the abbreviations, or I've made up my own slide that gives you all of the variances. So here's the direct material, the direct labor. We'll break the manufacturing overhead into the variable variances and the fixed manufacturing overhead variances. Here's an explanation of these abbreviations right here. And then this is the calculations on how to do these very important standard overheads allowed, or standard hours allowed, standard hours allowed for direct labor, and standard quantity allowed. So I would recommend highly that you print this individual slide off, and you have it in front of you when you do problems. Okay, so again, here's our direct material variances. Now we got to separate it into the price variance, and the quantity variance, again, it still adds up to $8,500 favorable, but you can see the price variance is very favorable, where the quantity variance is unfavorable. And so for each one of these, you know who to go to. So for price, you would go to the purchasing supervisor. For quantity variance, you would inquire the production supervisor. So not only do you know what is the variance that is either favorable or unfavorable, but you know who to actually go and speak to about why these variances happen. Okay, so we typically look at these together, okay? And this is going to be the direct material quantity variances uh, you can see that this is the formula I was talking about, the actual quantity times the difference between the actual price and the standard price, and then the direct material quantity variance is going to be the standard price, and then the actual quantity used, and then the standard quantity allowed which this is an interesting calculation because the standard quantity allowed requires you to take the actual cases that you needed times the standard number, in this case, of pounds per case. All right, so now you have direct labor variances. We looked at the direct material variances, now we're looking at the direct labor, and we have a rate variance, which is like the price variance, but it's for the, the actual wage that you're paying people, and the efficiency variance, which is similar to the direct material 
variance that we have. Okay, so what I mentioned was the direct labor efficiency variance is similar to the direct material quantity variance. In other words, how efficiently are you using the materials, or in this case, the labor that you have at your production? All right, so the, the rate variance then is going to be the actual hours and then times the difference between the actual rate, which is what you actually paid your workers, and the standard rate, which is what is the benchmark that we're using. And notice any time that the actual amount is higher than the standard amount, you have an unfavorable variance. And when you do this calculation, what you'll find is unfavorable is positive. It's positive because the cost is greater. So in other words, positive costs are unfavorable. So if this was revenue, we would want to have a positive. But in this case, we're talking about cost. And so when you do the calculation and the number is positive, it's unfavorable. And if it's negative, it's favorable. I just like to look and see if this is greater, if the actual is greater than the standard, then it's going to be unfavorable. The efficiency variable for direct labor is going to be the calculation of the standard rate, which again is $22 per hour. Remember that comes from our standard cost card. And then we're going to take the actual number of hours, which they gave us this number also, and then the standard hours that are allowed, and on your sheet, you'll see the calculation is the actual number of cases, which is 31,000, times the standard number of hours for each case, which is 0.05, and I believe that's in direct labor hours. Okay, so once again, uh, because the actual, in this case, is less than the standard, it's favorable. So when you do the calculation, you'll see that this is less than this. So you have $1,100 favorable direct labor efficiency variance. Put the two together and you have your direct labor rate variance, which is unfavorable. You have your direct labor efficiency variance, which is favorable. And when these are different, so when you have an unfavorable and a favorable, you're going to take the difference between the absolute values, and whichever one is greater, that's the sign that you use. Okay, so that's a pretty easy calculation, but you get the idea. If they're both unfavorable, you would have added them together. Both favorable, add them together. Different unfavorable and favorable is different, subtract the two, and then use the sign, which had the highest absolute number. All right, so looking down through direct material, direct labor, here's the formulas. And more important for this one, you already have the formulas, but what you have here is who is responsible or who would you inquire? The purchasing supervisor, if it's direct material price variance. Production supervisor for the direct material quantity variance. When it comes to wages, you're going to look at either human resources or production supervisor. And of course, direct labor efficiency is going to be the production supervisor. All right, so again, you have these formulas in several places. I do recommend you print out that one slide that I, I put in there specifically to solve problems. Sometimes you're just going to plug in numbers. Sometimes you have to do a little bit of calculation. And sometimes you have to do several calculations. But for the most part, these formulas will answer about 75 80% of the problems, at least in the short answered ones. All right, so the advantages of using standard costs and variances, well, you can have benchmarks, okay? Again, a standard cost is a budget 
for one unit. So you can benchmark each of your products and how much they should cost to make. So this becomes very useful in budgeting. It also gives motivation to those different supervisors that we looked at previously because they're obviously going to try and want to have favorable variances. And it can simplify bookkeeping when you see the, the journal entries that we use later on in the chapter. The only thing I will mention is that probably only about 10% of manufacturing businesses actually use standard costs and variances. Okay, so it's not used widely. But the reason that I teach it and the reason you need to know it is if you ever take the CMA exam, a lot of problems come from this concept of variances and standard costs. You'll definitely be asked a number of questions on the certified managerial accounting exam, these types of questions. Okay, some of the disadvantages of using standard costs and variances. Those standard costs can become outdated relatively quickly, and that cause for an inaccurate standard. The lack of timeliness, okay, because some companies like to have just in time and up to date. Everything has to be done exactly uh, as fast as possible, which is where that lean thinking comes in again. The focus on operational performance measures and visual management. Uh, also, because there's so much of an increase in automation and a decrease in direct labor, those standard costs really do not do as much they're not as valuable. And that's why I say only about 10% of companies use it. And you can have unintended behavioral consequences also. Okay, so we're going to leave it off here. And then we'll get into the overheads, the variable overhead variances, and the fixed overhead variances. And then we'll look at the journal entries for this type of accounting method.